Hi, and welcome to Building Healthy Relationships with Tonya Robinson Lloyd, a member of Robinson Lloyd Resiliency Group, also done business as Lloyd and Lloyd. I'd like to give a special thanks to Ms. Tamara Cooper for the opportunity to present our Parent Workshop Series to you virtually. The objectives for today would be for us to define healthy relationships. We will complete the relationship satisfaction and self-esteem scale, understand the attachment theory, discuss ACEs and how it affects, you know, how we connect to others. And we're going to look at three steps of overcoming communication pitfalls. What is a healthy relationship? I always like for our workshops to be very inclusive and, and engaging. And so I'd like us to close our eyes and think of the most satisfying relationship that we ever had, whether it was a parent-child relationship, a romantic relationship, a job relationship, or a mentor-mentee relationship. You know, something that really, really made us feel fulfilled, good, happy. And and we saw that that, that person was there for us through, during some really, really difficult and really happy times as well as we were there for them. And, and just think, you know, what were the elements of, of that relationship that made it so fulfilling for you? And, and there you'd have the answer that a relationship is built on mutual respect, trust, honesty, and support, right? So at our school, we, we have love and respect, the core of every relationship that is strong. Right, so the relationship brings more joy than stress into our lives. The qualities of a healthy relationship, is it, is it supportive and, and do you feel listened to? Not just heard, but listened to. Do you feel respected? Is communication open and healthy and, and safe? Do you feel trust? Are you able to be yourself? Are you honest? Are you, do you feel safe? Do you feel equality? And those are the qualities of a healthy relationship, having all of these various needs met. Now we're going to look at, you know, the relationship satisfaction scale. At our company, we like to know what is really going on before we could do anything about it. We like to have data. And that data for us, uh, you know, under using standardized scales, to measure how someone is seeing things. And we'd like to look at our relationship satisfaction scale as well as our self-esteem scale. The relationship satisfaction scale was designed by Dr. David Burns, who's the author of 10 Days to Create Self-Esteem, as well as uh, the Feel Good book. And Rosenberg's self-esteem scale also has been standardized and, and it will give us an idea of how we view ourselves, our sense of self-worth. And what we want to do right now is to sort of, you know, reflect on, on words by Tony Robbins, who said that the quality of our lives depends on the quality of our communication. And the most important communication, of course, is how we communicate with ourselves. What are the words are we what what words are we speaking to ourselves? And here we have the communication scale by Dr. Burns, where he looks at communication and openness, resolving conflicts and arguments, degree of affection and caring, intimacy and closeness, satisfaction with our role in the relationship satisfaction with the other person's role in the relationship and our overall satisfaction with the relationship itself. Now we're going to look at the, the scores. What do our scores mean? Uh, 0 to 10, extremely dissatisfied with the relationship. 11 to 20, very dissatisfied. 21 to 25, moderately dissatisfied. Self-esteem scale is the, the, the scale ranges from 0 to 30 where 15 to 25 uh, represents a normal range, and below, below 15, uh, we have low self-esteem. And again, 
this is just a, a marker of what we're feeling, what we're experiencing right now. But it, it is not a, determine, a determining factor of who we are going to be always. It helps us to know I'm going to improve and, and, and there are things that I can do to improve how I feel about both my relationship as well as how I feel about myself. Next, we're going to look at the attachment theory by Bowlby. And here we have my newborn, who you would have heard uh, coughing a little bit. She, she drinks her water a little bit too fast, but, uh, but she's fine. And, and uh, we're looking at attachment because it's very important. It, it, it forever uh, sort of cements in a way how we are able to connect with others. Uh, my mom always told me that I was a very open, loving, happy baby, always, you know, going to strangers very openly. And she was a little bit concerned about that because I would just go freely to people and, and be laughing and very bubbly. And, and, uh, and so she must have created, though, a lot of security for me to feel as though I could explore the world with such bravery. Because the, the responsiveness and availability of the caregiver creates that sense of security for us. The infant knows that that caregiver is dependable. This creates a secure base for the child to then explore the world. Right? Again, uh, in my own childhood, both my parents were very responsive. My mom was sharing with me recently that every time I smiled, my dad will come and put his face there and say, I'm smiling for him. And she she would get you know peeved about it, but um, but it it's just good that you know that they were there and 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 respond responsive to the the cues that I that I had. Uh, next we're going to look at the attachment style. So Mary Ainsworth developed on Bowlby's ideas of of security and and parent or caregiver and child interactions and. She did her own research based on a strange situation where she let 12 to 18 months old be left alone and then reunited with their mothers. And she observed three attachment styles, which we would look at briefly. The secure attachment, ambivalent insecure attachment, avoidant insecure attachment, and disorganized insecure attachment was then developed by Maine and Solomon in 1986. The secure attachment is where the infant showed marked the distress when the parent left and when the parent returned, they were happy again. Ambivalent attachments when the, the child was very distressed and the parent left, but very ambivalent about their return. It was neither here nor there for them. Avoidant attachment was when the, the child showed distress, but when the parent returned, they were avoiding the parent. And disorganized attachment is a mix of dazed, confused, uh, disoriented by the return of the parent. And, and we're going to look again, so we're focusing this first, first piece, the first half of our presentation is really on, on the, the impact of, of childhood attachments and a sense of security, as well as trauma, the, ro the role of trauma, baby, the role of trauma. Uh, so we're looking at adverse childhood experiences for now we have ACEs, uh, abuse, neglect, household dysfunction. Under abuse, we're looking at physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. When we think of abuse, abuse is a, a bit of a word that is thrown around a bit lightly. We, we, we want to bear in mind that abuse is performed by someone who's intentionally trying to cause harm to someone else, right? We have neglect, physical, emotional, household dysfunction, uh, a loved one with uh, mental health challenges. I prefer that word to mental illness because a challenge sounds as though it's something that we could overcome with love and, and compassion and, of course, the right treatment. Um, sometimes we witness a mother treated violently as well as a father treated violently, right? So there, there are men who experience physical abuse and, and it's, uh, it's a different type of, of shame that they experience. 
uh, in, in terms of the, the roles, right? The, the different gender roles we have in society. And of course, shifting that because we, we do have uh, same sex unions and, and, and um, abuse or physical abuse may take place in those relationships as well. Uh, we also have divorce and separation, right? The, the, the divorce rate is 50-50, uh, where 50% of people who get married get divorced. And so that's something that children have to face and, and, and work through with the family. Uh, incarcerated relatives, you know, I've worked with kids who've been very, very traumatized by a brother being incarcerated or or a dad being incarcerated or a mom being incarcerated and, and that sense of not knowing what is going to happen. Uh, they're, 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 they're in limbo. They're staying by different relatives. Nobody wants to tell them what's really going on. You know, they're left to sort of imagine the worst in, in some cases as, as they're just sort of trying to figure out well, what's going on. And, will I ever see my loved one again? So that's just an immense amount of emotional uh, trauma. And of course, we have the substance abuse, the, the, the different uh, epidemics right now. We have the uh, heroin, um, heroin and, 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 um, and, and, and those types of drugs, and, and of course, alcohol and and uh, cocaine and other forms of, of addictive substances um, affecting or impacting the, the quality of, of attention and responsiveness that we could give had we not been um, influenced by any substance. Okay, and, and so we're gonna look now at our own ACEs score and, and just understanding what this means. You know, so it's all for insight. What does this mean if I have gone through trauma? And, and, and again, for us to remember that as human beings, we are filled with resilience and with hope and, and with so much strength, right? Just think about what we've gone through as a community, the resilience to keep showing up and to keep doing our, our best, what we go through as a family, uh, you know, just experiencing illness and, and, and having to bounce back. From, from that, whether it's a physical, mental, emotional, whatever type of illness that we, we are struggling with or a challenge possibly that we're struggling with and then we bounce back. All right, so take an opportunity to find your score and we're gonna look at what that means, right? So if your score is four or more, research has shown that, that the actual ACEs score of, of four and higher could mean increased, um, chronic illnesses, whether it's high blood pressure, hypertension, heart disease, lung disease. So, so there's a direct correlation between the tra childhood trauma and, and, um, and health, health um, chronic illnesses in, in adulthood. And that's why this, um, this indicator is so, so crucial for us to, to have lifestyle changes when we realize, you know what, I've been through some stuff and my, my habits may not be the best for me or, or, the, the, or giving me the, the highest quality of life possible. And, and that really is the heart of mental health. It's, it's about our quality of life, improving our quality of life. Okay, so when children are overloaded with stress hormones, they are in flight, fright, or freeze mode. And they can't learn in school. It's it's like they, as 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 Daniel Goleman said in his book Social and Emotional Intelligence, both his books Social Intelligence and Emotional Intelligence, that the emotional brain literally hijacks or sabotages the logical brain. So you have uh, children, and you say, well, this child was academically just outperforming and doing really well. And, and they, you know, they've experienced something. We always, you know, say, well, there's something going on because the child is no longer interested in their schoolwork or they seem very distracted. And that's where we call on um, our mental health professionals to, to give some, 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 to share some tools to help, help the students get back on track. 
And as adults, we experience the same thing. We're going to work, we're very distracted. And, and again, we have EAP services or other private co companies to, to say, you know what, I, I wanna get help for this. And, and it's okay to ask for help, right? Because we have very, very plastic brains and lives where our brains are constantly evolving and, and shooting out new neurons for us to adapt and for us to cope in our environment. And we build resilience factors, such as asking for help, developing trust, forming positive attitudes, and listening to feelings. Feelings are very, very important. Uh, and and it's, 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 it's that emotional glue that you get with somebody when they say, you know what, this person gets me. They get me. They get me, right? And, and it's that connection that they get what I'm going through, what I'm experiencing. They get my feelings. And it helps us to improve our lives. Again, quality of our lives. I like to introduce case studies because it helps us to focus, zone in, and, 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 and sort of realize that stress and, and resilience, being able to be resilient and bounce back, it's, it's part of our human condition. And, and we, we sometimes feel alone, like, am I the only one going through this? And, and the truth is, we're not. We are absolutely not alone. And so we have Stan and Mary. They've been fighting for years. They decided to get professional counseling, and Mary refers to Stan as a spineless mama's boy. Stan refers to Mary as an uncaring, insecure, jealous pain in the neck. It would be hard for us to determine how they fell in love, uh, but they do claim to want their marriage. They both claim to love each other, but they're unable to stop reacting from what Dr. Brody coined their defense mode. And I do have references to Dr. Brody for, for those of you who want to read her book. It is an excellent book. Stop the Fight, excellent book. Uh, Mary thinks couples should rely on each other and not have outside interference. Stan loves his mother, and he is the only support that she has. He can't understand why Mary can't accommodate her, and Stan agrees that his mother sometimes gives her opinions even when they are not requested, but <clears throat> she means well. Stan feels pressured to choose between his wife and his mother. Mary feels like she has to compete for Stan's love, and, and this reminds her of her childhood where she felt she had to compete with her brother for her parents' love. And Stan has always tried to please his mother, live up to her expectations, as she had a very traumatic time with his father. So here you have it again, that, that childhood element coloring their ability to, to connect and to have fulfilling interactions, interpersonal relationships, right? And that's why we spent the first half of the presentation really zoning in a bit on understanding attachments and trauma and understanding how we could cultivate that experience into something that's really beautiful and powerful and, and empowering. The debrief, uh, we have to learn to communicate from the core and that takes, and that's why we did the self-esteem test as well. What is my core? Right, so, so they, Stan and Mary, they can stop reacting from the defense mode. It is going to take one person initially <clears throat> to decide to stop the fight. And then the other person will come along, but it, it would take one. It only, it takes two to fight, but it takes one person to decide, you know what, I'm, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. And then the other person too decides to grow or go, right? Grow or go. And it's something that we, we will take in stages. Avoiding communication pitfalls. So here are, here are the three tips. And, and I have, uh, you know, pulled these tips together or, or, or adapted them, again, from Dr. Brody's uh, influence. Her book was really, really powerful. And she's saying, you know, identify your own negative thoughts about the person, your own mindset. So it's, it's about us having these stuck mindsets that, you know what, this person's mean or they're a jerk or, or they want to hurt me. 
right? So having this mindset and, and what, what this mindset, so we're looking at the mindset as well as how do we respond when we're in that defense mode, right? And we're going to expand on it a little, a little bit more later on. We also have to reframe those thoughts by focusing on the person's core or the good goodness, the, the goodness that we fell in love with or the goodness that we admired. We want to focus on that goodness and even list it, list all the good characteristics of that person and, and understand what they may be feeling that influences them to react from their defense mode toward us. Right, because it's a two-way thing. It, they're two people in pain. So how would we pain that person? And we have to focus as as best as possible, as though it's a meditation. Even when that person is responding to us from their defense mode, or they start to raise their voice at us, or curse at us, or whatever they do when they're in defense mode, that we choose to do the right thing. That we choose to respond from the core. And it does not make us weak. It means that we are choosing to go higher, to be our higher selves and to expand from, from the baseness of, of reacting in anger and reacting in pain, right? And so we, we have to know what is my core, what is my true self? And, and I'm, if I am, I see myself as a loving, generous, compassionate person then I'm going to respond from a place of compassion, knowing that the, the, the person who's screaming or cursing at me is doing so from a place of pain. And, and I can have empathy for that person's pain. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying that their behavior is right, that they should curse and scream, but it's what they know. <clears throat> it's what they know right now. And it's not what we have to accept, but we, ac we accept that they are in pain because People who are not in pain, a happy person who won't just scream and shout or curse at someone else, right? And, and so it's, it's just sort of getting to that place of empathy that, wow, this person is in a lot of pain. And I could either help their pain or make it worse. And so imagine someone's responding to you from a place of pain and sadness. And you say to them, instead of saying, why are you, why are you screaming at me? Or why are you responding to me in this way? Instead, you say, what can I do to help you feel less stressed? I mean, that type of question is really going to throw them for a loop because they're like, wow, I'm, I'm kind of being hot-headed or being who I, who, who I get to be when I'm, I'm in defense mode with this person and they are showing me that they care, right? And so that's going to have to de-escalate their position and and with time they'll have they'll they may be able to reflect on their own behavior uh and and decide that they want to elevate to a higher place as well and that's that's showing how one it takes one person to say you know what i am going to be that person to have compassion i'm going to be that person to have respect and i am going to be my best self so it's it's personal in that sense and so we're going to look a little bit a little bit deeper on on negative thoughts so the negative thoughts or positive thoughts we have a choice i, I we see what we look for right and one of my early influencers uh, a lady by the name of florence shin she wrote the book the game of life and how to play it and basically said that, you know, we, we get what we look for. We get what we put out. We say what we, you know, whatever we say with, with sort of a definiteness of, of purpose, that is what we are going to experience. And, and it's sometimes difficult to catch ourselves when we are constantly, you know, operating from a place of pain to realizing that that is perpetuating more and more pain for us, right? So we, we want to list all of the negative thoughts. And then, of course, we want to be able to understand our defense mode where, you know, we may ignore, we may say hurtful remarks, we may scream, we may break things, we may dismiss the person, we may ignore their emotional cues, right? It's a lot of operating from a place of, 
how do we transform that pain and gloom and woe is me uh, to, you know what, that person isn't all that bad. I mean, after all, we are uh, together, right? Or we are trying to, to have something together, what, whatever the case may be. How can we start to see the different or the alternative perspectives? Right? When I'm working with kids in the Resilient Stars program, we, we look for alternative and even comical ways of viewing the same situation that has been causing us to feel a sense of hopelessness. And we start by looking at, at the positives. In the terms of dealing with a person, we, we start to list their positives. What do we like about them? Genuinely like about them. Then we use empathy to find out what they may be feeling. Do they feel afraid? Do they feel embarrassed? Do they feel uh, hopeless as well? Right? And then we respond from our core with open hearts and open minds. And, and a sense of behind anger, what really exists? Pain, pain, lots of pain, disappointment, fears, including that from the past. And can we choose to respond from a place of compassion? So can we go past our pain as well and choose compassion? And, and, and so think of compassion and and see, see yourselves, you know, if you're spiritual or, or not, see, see the last time that someone was compassionate to you. Right. Okay, and that brings us to the end of our presentation on building healthy relationships. Again, it has been an honor presenting to you. You would have heard my little one in the background and uh, she did really really well actually letting us get through this together so i do appreciate your your support always you know you whether i've been there and uh had the baby with me or you know or she's with her grandma in the background uh, i do appreciate um just a continuous opportunity to get to to, to grow with you, to work with you, and, and to just embrace our human experience together. Again, here are the references uh, that I've used for this presentation. Please feel free to reach out to me, whether you want to um, call my direct line, everything is provided here for you. And I try to get back within 24 hours to, to everyone. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you again. Thank you to Mr. Mara Cooper. Thank you for the opportunity to present and, and to share. All right, we're all sharing. Have a wonderful day and uh, looking forward to our next virtual presentation. Thanks again and bye for now.